Lupita of the Sea by Matthew Wardell. Sit closer, child, and I'll tell you the story of when I first saw the sunken world. In fact, I may have been the first to ever see it, at least for many years, it's true. I was still just a little girl, not much older than you. I remember pacing across the deck of the fortune, as I'd done a thousand thousand times by then. The sun was so large and hot in the sky that its light shone down right through the blue-green water. Even so, I could only see the compressor hose running down a half dozen meters. Marcel was probably twice that length down, and the thought drove me mad, slow as I was to admit it to him. The compressor itself was roaring loudly as it always was, the hunk of junk, but that meant it was working. What wasn't working quite right was Bruno's wheezing voice wailing away behind me with every strange note of that soggy accordion he loved so well. Marcel and Bruno liked to boss me around because I was smaller and younger, but at least I was still third in charge on the fortune, and that was a big responsibility. Back then the ship was just about 10 meters long, with a sail rigging at least as high. The hull was once painted a bright red, but by the time I was part of the crew, it had mostly chipped away to show the old wood beneath. There were dirty tires stripped along the side that would smell of burning rubber on a hot day. But so would Bruno if you weren't always lazing in the shade of that tarp canopy at the stern. He's been under for a long time, I fretted. Bruno was singing some song about the sea. It was all he knew. He'd joke it was all any of us knew. Though, truth be told, I knew a great deal for a girl of only eleven and three quarters. I could tie all kinds of knots, though I never wore shoes, ever. Always hated the things, too small for my feet. I could also hold my breath longer than any of the grown-ups, though I suppose you and your siblings can hold yours even longer nowadays. What I'm getting at is, I was special for my time, and not just because of my dark skin. Even still, Marcel would never let me dive beneath the ocean. Of course, I knew how dangerous compressor diving was supposed to be, save for an elite few. Marcel, that is, and Bruno too once upon a time. So I sat on hose duty. I would sit beside this great coil of rubber hose that hissed like a sleeping water snake. If I found a leak, I'd promptly patch it up with my trusty duct tape, wrapping it around until the hose was quiet. Baby stuff. Impatient, I leaned over the starboard side of the fortune and stuck my head down in the water. My eyes could see far in the water, but not so far as to spot Marcel. The jostling of the hose reassured me he was kicking around somewhere down there, probably above the tops of the drowned towers. I screamed soundlessly into the growing darkness after him, and then pulled my head back up out of the water. Are you even listening to me, girl? Bruno had tossed the accordion aside, and was hunkered forward off his folding chair that stunk of salt and seaweed. Bruno was old and leathery, at least ten times my age if I had to guess at the time. The hair on his head had fallen out, so he'd grown out a bushy beard to restore balance. He always wore these little white shorts that looked small even on his tiny legs, but he made up for it with his barrel of a chest, always bearing the mischievous face of Huey O'Hare tattooed in the skin. I told him, Sorry, Mr. Bruno. Don't worry, Lupita. He wrapped his cane on the deck. You'll get plenty of time to chase a sunken world when you're bigger. I'm big enough now, I muttered, always half hoping he'd hear. Maybe Bruno did hear, as he often knew a great deal more than he let on. The compressor hose suddenly tugged once, then twice. Better reel him in. The labor side of hose duty. I began pulling the hose in, hand over hand, until the open end emerged, fizzling with leaking air. No one attached to the end. I cupped my hands and called out for Marcel. Marcel! At first, there was no response. Then, a few meters out, a billowing of bubbles heralded the dramatic appearance of Marcel. It wasn't the first time he'd made a great show of his diving as a way of teasing me. His short hair was plastered to his head, brown eyes magnified under a big oval half-mask. A newly grown pencil mustache shaded over a mouth twisted into a cruel grin. Ahoy! Marcel! I might have sounded angrier than I was. 
You best turn off that compressor, Lupita, he laughed. Marcel liked to twist his wispy excuse for a mustache, lording his few extra years over me. Bruno hobbled over. What did you find, boy? Pale and lanky, Marcel climbed onto the fortune and spilled the contents of the bag slung over his shoulder onto the deck. Let's see here. He began sorting through the pile of rusted scrap he procured. We got a bundle of wires. Crap. Bruno kicked them aside. Marcel had been expecting that, surely, but a look of annoyance still flashed across his face. He continued, A couple hubcaps. Forty yuans each. Bruno kicked them aside, too. Oh, how about this? Marcel picked up a yellow license plate. Flicking off the moss, he revealed the words, Hot Mama, imprinted in bold black. If you don't understand what it means, child, ask your parents. Bruno guffawed. That one's pretty good. But is that all you got? One craft picked clean? Trying to run a business here. Marcel grumbled something about adventure and a lost sense of discovery as he scooped the scrap back into the bag. Bruno just sighed and returned to his chair. Things were always like that between the two of them, but such is the way men are. Always too afraid to show their love through affectionate means. Bruno said, We'd better get back to the triumph before it's too dark to see. Marcel and I yanked on the mess of ropes that functioned as the fortune's rigging. That patchy red sail deployed and immediately caught a bounty of wind, ever so reliable. You know, even after the fortune was put to rest, I've worn that sail as a dress on special occasions. It still always carries me in the right direction. But I digress. I asked Marcel if I could steer home that day. Sure, Lou, he told me. I grabbed the rudder and leaned into it with all my weight, turning the fortune northwards. The sun was halfway submerged into the ocean, giving the water a shimmering, fiery glow, like a sea of rubies. And the greatest gem of them all, at least to me, the triumph, appearing on the horizon first as a mass of silhouettes, then slowly blinking to life with the lighting of signaling torches and high beam lights shooting off into the sky. Nobody, not even Bruno, knew how long the Triumph had been afloat. They say it started with just one barge, and then another tied itself on, and another. It eventually grew into a fleet of vessels, some bound together, others trailing more freely. To hundreds, as it remains today, it was home. Marcel dropped the main sail as we approached, and then took control of the rudder to steer us alongside a docking barge. Looking like a great black turtle, I carried the bag of scrap over my back. It took some convincing, but Bruno allowed Marcel to carry him up onto the barge. Every time he consented to being carried, it took a great chip off his pride. But at least his darling Pearl wasn't around to see. Lupita, go dump our earnings with the rest, Marcel told me over his shoulder. I lugged the bag across the Triumph, weaving by streams of running and laughing children, old women stirring great cauldrons of spicy squid stew. Skipper the mutt holding a starfish in his mouth. I remember that little look of inquisition on his face. Then, he heard a shouting woman tailing behind him, and he bolted away. I still couldn't name everyone in the village at the time. I was much too busy with myself and my work back then. But everyone knew who I was. My pitch-dark skin, like a moonless midnight, they'd say. And my great tangle of frizzy hair that always dried up immediately when I climbed out of the water. I was something of a local celebrity. Like you, my differences were a sign that I was a gifted individual, passed down from the ancient peoples of the sunken world far to the west. Don't ever forget that, child. Marcel and I had a tiny cabin then, and no, it wasn't like that. We had two hammocks, just sheets tacked into either wall. My side bore shelves of my collection of shiny stones and trinkets I'd found, floating at sea or washed up on the odd beach, just like they'd found me. I plopped the bag down on Marcel's side, decorated with posters of monks sitting around or doing kung fu in bright red dresses. The monks were all bald like Bruno, except it was by their choice. Mantis style, crane style, tiger style, Marcel was always going on about these, but I doubted there was ever such a thing as a tiger, much less that it taught musty old monks how to fight. As usual, I snatched one of the saltwater taffies Marcel kept hidden under his hammock, and hurried to Miss Pearl's barge. 
The moon hung bright in the sky, lulling the waves into a calming, ever-present rhythm against the sides of the ship. It was like a gentle heartbeat. Impatient and deft as I once was, I leaped from barge to barge towards where dozens of villagers were gathered on the communal yacht, though it technically belonged to Miss Pearl and her father before her. Several fires were built around the deck, with all assortments of seafood being fried on spits and passed around on sweet-smelling kebabs. I couldn't keep my stomach from growling. I'd know that sound anywhere. Miss Pearl turned from her own fire. She herself was the warm hearth of the triumph, large and robust, old and wiser than I'll ever be. She was a mother to the motherless. Marcel and Bruno were dining with her, with a roasted octopus tentacle set aside for me. That's my girl, she said to me, as I took the offering and joined them. Lou? Marcel spoke through a mouthful of octopus. We were just telling Miss Pearl about the giant metal tower today, speculating on what it may have been. Right, Bruno? Marcel elbowed the old man, who often grew tongue-tied around Pearl. That, and he seemed to be more than a few gulps deep into her ale. Still, any talk of the sunken world lit a flame in Bruno's eyes that was brighter than any of the bonfires around us. That's right, he said. Lupita, have I ever told you about the web? He had, many times, but I just shook my head and continued eating. Long ago, before the sinking of the sunken world, the surface dwellers had completely mechanized nearly everything that Mother Earth had to offer them, so they were forced to create their own world. His crooked fingers spread through the air before him. It was a world intangible without the aided vision of the right tools, a parallel world that flowed unseen through the very air of the physical world. Kind of like the radio waves from the monks, Marcel offered. Exactly. Except, this new world you could enter with your mind and leave your physical body behind. In fact, they had achieved so much on Mother Earth that they spent almost all of their time floating through the air like the very water spirits that guide us today. They could be anywhere and everywhere at once, like gods. Bruno's fingers twitched as if trying to grasp the web before his very eyes. They also had ships that could sail right through the air, Marcel said. Not just the air, Bruno cut in, but out into the void, to Mother Earth's sisters. Pearl asked, Did the web stretch into the void? Bruno smiled. Good question, and one I don't know the answer to. Maybe it still does, beyond the clouds and the blue sky. Bruno paused for effect, his bushy beard dancing in the light of the fire. Maybe they float out there, even now. He leaned back with his jug of ale, letting the thought ferment. I always admired Bruno's passion, and the way Miss Pearl and Marcel would listen so attentively. I asked, but where was all the water? Frozen, like the frosty peaks of the monks' mountains. The whole world? I had found it hard to believe, especially with how hot the sun had always shone down on us. The whole world. Bruno would drink a lot more before the night was over. Marcel and I carried him back to his cabin, Marcel taking Bruno by his big torso with his chest like a barrel full of ale, and I his little chicken bone legs. Marcel kicked Bruno's door open with his heel, and gently lay the old sailor down on his cot. I want to go back, Bruno hiccuped. <laughs> I need to see the sunken world. I know. Marcel undressed Bruno and tucked him in. I took the chance to examine Bruno's collection of Huey O'Hare relics he'd procured from the mainland. Little clay statuettes, chipped mugs with the rabbit's smiling face plastered on the sides, hanging metal necklaces of his big-eared silhouette. He was on more things than the Buddha. Some even thought he might be one of the Hindu gods who had been all but entirely swept away with the sea. Marcel touched my shoulder, wordlessly telling me it was time to go. We crept out of the cabin, leaving Bruno snoring flat on his face. The next morning, I woke up to the sound of Skipper barking outside. Marcel wasn't in his hammock, and the pile of scrap was gone. It was dusk when I rushed out of our cabin, the deck of the Triumph still soggy with dew. 
I slapped along in my bare feet towards the barking, which seemed to be coming from where we docked the little fortune. I arrived at the ship just as Marcel was untying its bonds. Skipper was jumping circles around him, nipping at his heels. Cut it out, Skipper, Marcel hissed, nearly dropping the hunk of cooked fish dangling from his mouth. Don't go without me, I called. I ran over and knelt beside the dog who lapped at my face lovingly. Where are you going? The mainland. I'm just selling some of our scrap. I want to go. It's boring, and it's safer here. How can it be dangerous and boring? I didn't say dangerous, I... He sighed. <sighs> Climb in. I commanded Skipper to stay. He sat down, but not without a whimper of protest. I climbed onto the fortune, and together Marcel and I sailed away from the village. Skipper's barking was shrinking away just as a blip of land to the north appeared over the water. It was the cragged and snowy peak of a mountain, so big and powerful that it seemed to lead the charge out of the sea and into the sky for the valleys and pepperings of villages surrounding it. The range had no name, at least not one that everybody agreed on, but then what things do? I have always wondered what those mountains would have looked like before the waters rose, how mighty they must have appeared to the sunken peoples. The sun was high over Mother Earth by the time we arrived on the shore at the foot of the mountain. Here, there was a bustling traffic of ships in all shapes and sizes. Long woven canoes, stuffed with too many rowers, and metallic rafts formed from the skeletons of old land crafts being pushed around by men wielding long poles. There were even floating houses, tacked into the mountain face so they wouldn't drift off into the endless ocean. Marcel steered us with practiced aim into an open dock, and I hopped ashore to tie us up. Over, under, around, and around, like an electric eel. I hope you know that one, child. It's gotten me out of plenty of tangle. Knots, at least, were something Marcel has always trusted me to do. Lugging our prizes over his back, Marcel took my hand and led the way up the mountain. I can still smell the pungent mix of salted fish and cherry tobacco that overpowered the air. There was a blind boy playing music on some sad, stringed instrument I'd never heard. There were men wearing flowing, exotically colored dresses, like those that Pearl wore. I saw a skinny woman effortlessly straddle three babies at a time. One man, in an ornate red vest, carried on his back a great barrel of oysters, which he tried to peddle to me as we passed. Marcel pulled me closer, but I didn't mind. My land legs hadn't quite grown, you see, so the solid ground, mixed with all the new sensations, was overwhelming. Where are the monks you like so much? I asked him. They live in the temples up in the mountain. Is that where we're going? No, Lou, he sounded grim. We're going to see a doctor. He led us out past the bazaar and up a stony path amidst grass that grew up to my knees. Are you sick, Marcel? He's not for me. Is Bruno sick? Marcel let my hand fall. Yes. The doctor's name is Joshi. He might be able to fix Bruno's legs. He readjusted the bag on his shoulder and forged onwards without another word. We waded through the grass until we came to a large plot of land that had been shorn down and outlined with a shoddy picket fence. Dr. Joshi's estate was a large wooden shack that had been fitted with a metal panel coating, stripped from the twisted wreckage of what must have once been a great ship laying nearby. Now it was just a skeleton. Marcel! How did a boat get so far inland? He didn't know, and was as mesmerized by the husked ship as I was. It looked as though it had had jutting metal arms like the fins of a whale, but they must have been torn off. The whole ship was scavenged clean. The only marking it bore was a faded red box, outfitted with several golden stars. The door of Joshi's house was painted with a different marking, a lime green symbol that looked like the spinning blades of a windmill. It's the Hindu symbol for peace, Marcel said, sensing my question. Marcel had always liked the mainland, similar to Bruno's love for what lay beneath the sea. It was not uncommon for Marcel to save his earnings, to spend on land-based things such as lessons from the monks and the scrolls he had collected in his room. Still, I knew Marcel's heart of hearts would always lie on the waves, just as mine did. We went inside what must have been Dr. Joshi's lobby, a row of velvet chairs that looked cleaned and dragged in from the ship 
were nailed to the wood plank floors. The walls were decorated with strings of beads and lace scarves, and posters of gods with faces much more divine and menacing than Huey O'Hare had ever looked. I heard two people, a man and a woman, speaking in a language I didn't know. Their footsteps approached, one an offbeat mixture of padding and clanking. Dr. Joshi? Marcel set the bag on the floor. Dr. Joshi was a man much younger than Bruno, though his work was already turning the hairs of his once dark beard gray. His skin was a light brown, nowhere near as dark as mine or yours, child. Joshi wore a white sheet, wrapped around him in a way that made him look not unlike one of the kung fu monks. A little old woman was with him, her face pruned and distraught. Come see me tomorrow, May. Joshi ushered her out and closed the door behind her. He looked me over, gawking at my large feet. You're quite the specimen. You don't have any diseases, do you? I told him I didn't think so. Well, you both look strong enough. Joshi bent down and poked at my giant feet. Marcel stepped in the way. We're not here for us. It's our friend back on the Triumph. You come from the Triumph? Joshi stepped back. What's in the bag? Not a head, is it? Treasure from the sunken world. Dr. Joshi rubbed his beard. You, come into my office. She can stay here. Marcel, I pleaded. Lupita, this is boring adult talk. I want to help Bruno. So do I. It'll just be a few minutes. Promise. I sighed and slumped into the waiting chair. I admit it was quite comfy. As I watched them retreat into Joshi's office, I noticed that where the doctor's right leg should have been was a great hunk of metal. That's right, child. I do not know where or how Dr. Joshi came about this ability to manipulate and even merge with metal, though he's not the first or last I have heard of with a similar ability. I can only suspect that it is an ancient art of the sunken peoples. I waited for some time before Marcel stormed out of Joshi's office, tossing the still full bag about angrily. Let's go, Lapita. He grabbed me roughly by the hand. Mr. Marcel, Dr. Joshi said. As a fellow man of business, I trust you to understand that I want to help, however unable I am to with current financial. It's not business, it's a man's life, Marcel spat. I don't think I'd ever seen my Marcel so angered. Nor had I ever heard of Bruno as being in as much trouble as he was. I didn't understand limb paralysis at the time, but I see now that such was the consequence of our line of work, the price a diver pays. Bruno's lifelong pursuit of adventure and the unknown had crippled not only his mind, but also his body. All I did know was that we needed money, same as ever. We made our way back to the bazaar and traded what we had for some fish, gasoline, and spare yuans, and then we got back on the fortune and sailed home. Good as it was to embrace Mother Earth once in a while, it was her waters that would always call to me. It was night once more by the time Marcel and I arrived back at the Triumph. Once more, the torches were lighting one by one as way of greeting us back into their midst. We saw that the village had coasted closer to the great metal tower we'd spotted the day before. The sunken world now loomed just below us. We hadn't spoken on the trip home. Marcel's fuming anger had extinguished into something closer to a deep sadness, of which I'd never seen overtake him. I dared not ask about Bruno. Pearl and Bruno were talking at the hearth, Miss Pearl stirring a pot of dark stew with a long-handled spoon. Her wrist worked around and around, but her eyes never left Bruno's, as he was finishing a dreamy tale from the prime of his youth. A smile spread from within his beard as he saw us approach, but his story never broke its stride. So here we were, at the sword point of these dirty pirates, when, out of nowhere, this scrappy little boy, no higher than my knees, jumps out from behind the barrels, growling and swinging a dagger like it was a full-sized cutlass. Pearl's laughter rang out like a great bell the monks would strike. Bruno continued, So they had no choice but to surrender! Imagine being boarded and hijacked by a fifty-pound stowaway. Scoundrel! Miss Pearl slapped Marcel's shoulder. Don't act like you and Uncle Jean didn't owe me your life, Marcel grinned. Oh, we did, Bruno reeled back. So we took the moment of surprise to scoop up our little savior, jump back on the fortune, and sail away. Much faster in those days, she was. 
And what about the trade? Pearl asked. Didn't need it. Little Marcel had stuffed his pockets full of yuans. We'd all heard the story before, but we laughed and laughed all the same. The night was full of shared chirpy cheese and exotic fruits we'd obtained from the mainland. Marcel never told Bruno about the doctor, and neither did I. As the night drew on and Bruno drew deeper into the bottom of his jug, his thoughts once more trailed to the mystery of the sunken world. Before his mood and stories became too dour, everyone called it a night and returned to their cabins, Bruno with his own cane and remaining strength. Nestled in my hammock, I listened to Marcel's breathing. I could tell he was awake. I said nothing, and instead waited until I was sure he had fallen asleep. It took a great deal of time. Hard-headed child I was, I thought that all we needed was a bit more money for Joshi to fix Bruno. And I knew where such fortunes must lay, and that I was the only one strong enough to get them with my paddle-like feet and huge lungs and clear eyes. I snuck from the cabin and across the Triumph towards where the fortune was docked. With the ship in my sight, the scuttling of someone following closely behind startled me. I spun around and saw it was Skipper the dog, nosy as ever. I urged him to remain shushed, for I was on a mission to save Bruno's life. Skipper seemed to understand, but whimpered all the same. Once I'd climbed onto the deck of the fortune, I forged around for the gasoline we'd bought that day and used it to fill the compressor. I tied off my sundress around my legs and strapped on a headlamp. Its beam shone out into the night, another spotlight dancing with those set up around the village. I wasn't afraid, not at all. In fact, I was more sure of what I was about to do than anything I'd ever done in all my eleven and three quarters of living. With the gift of age and the benefit of hindsight now, I feel less sure of my younger self's judgment. Flicking the compressor on into a loud chattering, I unraveled the long hose and took the hissing end of it into my mouth, clamping down with my teeth. The air was always dirty, tasting of rubber and gasoline. I hopped into the cold water, becoming another inky blot in the endless blackness of its waves. Skipper was whining now, and he looked set to jump in after me, so I pet and coaxed him until he was quiet. Offering a final wave to the mutt, I dove below the surface. I had seen the great metal tower just the other day in the sunlight, and we had already picked its upper half clean, but how can I explain to you, child, how foreboding and monolithic it seemed in the meager beam of my lamp? Far below, the points of dozens of other towers followed their tallest brother's lead, their bases obscured into an abyss that my lamp's beam could not pierce. Not wasting any time, oxygen, or gasoline, I propelled myself down towards the light. The stinking air from the hose came without an invitation, filling my lungs each time before returning to the surface as bubbles from my nose. I hugged close to the tower and used it as my guide, careful of the jutting shards of metal and glass that had protruded like rusted thorns for spirits know how long. By the time I'd reached the tops of the other towers, as far down as Marcel had ever been, I felt just the lightest pressure on my chest, as if Skipper were sleeping on top of me. No problem though I wasn't sure how much longer the hose would belay. Already I could see evidence of Bruno's tails that I had once discarded as tall. The tops of the buildings were interconnected with great metal lofts, like vines and leaves weaving around treetops. Just as Bruno said, this had to be the landing nest for the flying machines used by the sunken peoples. I could not investigate each building, but there seemed no trace of the machines or what they may have looked like. They all must have flown far away long ago, perhaps into the void, leaving their drowned city behind. I swam down between four of the structures, my light now spotting the waving forests of seaweed that had overgrown and ensnared everything below. Schools of fish, the new population, dispersed back into the shady weeds when we caught sight of each other. I must admit that by this point, the pressure exerting on my chest left a dull sort of pain inside my lungs and a numbing sensation in the tips of my toes. Swimming further, I was studying the portrait of a tall glass bottle embedded in the side of a tower when I was suddenly reeled backwards. The hose had torn free of my mouth. I scrambled in the darkness, my light scanning this way and that way, the open hose scooting along in the propulsion of that precious air meant for me. 
I honed in on it and quickly reinserted it into my mouth, feeling that dusty air filling my lungs once more. That was as far as the hose would allow me to swim, but it wasn't quite far enough. I thought that perhaps the tug on the hose was Marcel, who had probably been alerted by Skipper, that sweet blasted mutt, and the tug was a warning for me to come back. A plea. But it wasn't one I could submit to, not when I was so close to the city floor. I knew Marcel wouldn't dare reel the hose in, for fear of leaving me stranded at the bottom, so I returned one tug to let him know I was okay. Just one. With the hose in hand, as well as in mouth, I looped it around a jutting pole of a building once, twice, thrice. That way I could find it on my return. Yes, on my return. Taking a last lungful of compressed air, I kicked off deeper into the weeds. Perhaps it was the pressure of the depths, perhaps it was intoxicating air, perhaps it was Bruno's stories finally taking their hold on me, but I will never understand nor forget the mysteries the sunken world would show me at its surface. The streets were wide graveyards of hollowed and crushed land speeders, expensive luxuries I had heard were used on the mainland only for special occasions, and only by the wealthy. Everything was a mixture of stone and metal, cracked and infested with seaweed. Everywhere I looked there were smashed glass screens, many simply windows into nothing, while others still bore the faded and shadowy resemblance of pale faces, which looked as human as Marcel or Bruno or Pearl. Yet, there were no humans. For a moment, my light caught something in the shape of a large man. Instead, I was shocked to see it was the human-like figures of metallic giants, some caught in mid-stride, some standing with their arms raised in frozen fear or anger or perhaps even joy. Were these the beings from which Dr. Joshi had taken after with his metallic leg? I couldn't make out their finer details through the moss, but many were carved with slender curves that resembled their makers. Perhaps they'd even replaced their makers. The thought made me shudder. They stood lined up helplessly and with nobody to help, sentries forced to stand on guard at the bottom of the ocean for all of eternity, waiting vigilantly for someone to return. There was a dignified sadness about them, all standing apart from each other, not a single giant reaching out to hold another as their world was swallowed by the sea. I wondered why they had just stood there and let it happen. Was it hopeless for them to try and save themselves? Did they even want to? A chill was creeping up my limbs. Everything was so cold, even what had preserved. Nothing remained of the utopia that Bruno sought. Even so, I had to get something as proof of my visit. Something worthwhile that could save Bruno, though I knew I would never be able to free, much less carry, one of the giants to the surface. My lungs were already beginning to quiver, my air running out, so I swam to one of the giants anyway. I began frantically scattering the moss off of its body, searching for some way to yank off a trophy, anything of value. Nothing. I swam to another giant, forever sealed in a melancholy stoop over a raised arm. Whatever it had been interacting with or shielding now long gone. I swam for yet another giant, this one locked in an intense gaze at something in its hand. I felt along in the darkness for whatever the giant may have been staring at, and felt a hard, stone-like trinket belted onto its arm. The giant showed no sign of protest as I undid the buckle and slid the trinket off its arm and around my own slight wrist. For he or she or it to have been staring at the trinket in the final moments of life led me to believe that whatever I had taken was of supreme importance. I often feel twinges of guilt at having stolen from the giant, though I'm now beyond having the strength to return the trinket. Kicking off the seafloor, I swam towards where I thought I'd tied the hose, but it wasn't there. I looked around and could not find it. My chest was now pounding, and my lungs were now empty, so I made the split decision to rush towards the surface, oh so far away. What else could I do? Many tens of meters up, when the water was much less clouded, I saw the hose stretching out of sight in another direction, but it was too late, too far to chase the end of it and the dirty, life-giving air. I grabbed onto the hose and gave two tugs with what strength I had left. I felt the hose grow taut. Someone above was desperately pulling, but to no avail. 
It must have been caught on something from the sunken world. Was the giant I'd robbed taking his revenge? The hose jolted with three heaves before it finally moved. My vision was failing. The last of my breath escaped my lungs in a stream of bubbles that contained final words I could not say. I could not breathe. I could barely think. How young I was, I could not possibly understand the concept of death or recognize its icy grip crawling over me. All that came to me was how much I wanted to break through that shimmering ceiling and return to my own world above. Now, I've always held my doubts about the power of the water spirits, or at least their investment in the human race. My darkening thoughts never strayed towards prayer, but something in that moment overwhelmed me and lent me a momentary surge of warmth and power. I could feel the weight of the trinket on my arm, but it seemed to guide me, as if with a life spark of its own. If I'm thankful to any being, I can't shake the presence of the giant who I had robbed. It's as if from behind a veil, the veil of the web, the giant had forgiven me and was encouraging me. Go. You're almost there. Live. Expending my final reserves of strength, I wrapped myself in the hose and felt my hair pull back as I was reeled in towards the surface, still so far away. My senses failed me. Don't look so worried, silly child. I would not be here to relate this story to you today if I hadn't made it back to the surface alive. I remember my ears popping very painfully and my head bobbing up above the water. Marcel was shouting something, and he dove in, still dressed in his pajamas. He swam and towed me toward the deck of the fortune. I was coherent enough to thank Marcel and say some other things I'm too embarrassed to remember. I must have told him that I was dizzy and that I heard all over, and he realized I was going through the bends. We have to go back under, he told me, to which I could only shake my head. Just for a little longer, Lou, promise. He ripped my headlamp off and placed the compressor hose back in my mouth, and we carefully descended back down a few meters, he with no air at all. Taking me in his arms, he spun me around and massaged my skinny limbs, my protruding spine. I gasped with pain, and almost lost the hose that fed me that nurturing air, but I held on. I could feel warmness returning to my extremities, despite the cold water, and I placed a hand on Marcel's shoulder to let him know I was all right. He held on to me in a tight embrace for as long as his own lungs would last. Then he took my hand, and together we swam to the surface, where a great crowd wielding torches and flashlights had formed along the deck of the fortune. I flopped at their feet with what grace I could muster. Bruno was there. He tossed aside his cane and painfully knelt down to embrace me. What were you doing down there, girl? His eyes darted all over me and he seemed on the verge of tears. I couldn't say anything and instead let my wrist fall limply into his hands. From the light of the torches, the smiling face of Huey O'Hare looked back at us from what I would later learn was a wristwatch, the frozen arms of which were forever pointing at the very hour and minute that the sea claimed the sunken world. The wristwatch turned out to be worthless. We never could afford to pay Dr. Joshi, and Bruno's legs never got better. He never dove again. Oh, don't give me that look, child. You missed the point. Bruno did end up marrying Pearl, and they lived the last of their years together in bliss. The ghosts of the sunken world seemed to leave Bruno, at least to a degree. He finally lived on the surface, before he died. I never told Bruno how deep I'd gone, or what kind of world I saw down there. I thought it best to let him live out his days believing in something better, though some days I still question whether I should have told him the truth. Sometimes the truth can hurt more than a lie. Never forget that. Marcel made sure I never dove that deep again, until I told him the truth. He also thought it best that the secret be kept, at least until Bruno passed years down the line. Bruno lived long enough at least to see me grow into a beautiful young woman. I took Marcel as my husband, and gave birth to your uncles and your mother, child. And she gave birth to you and your siblings. I know you and your brothers and sisters can dive even deeper than I ever could, and hold your breath longer, and swim faster. Now, my feet don't seem so freakishly big, do they? 
Maybe that's the way the world is changing. Maybe one day, long after I'm gone, little Bruno, your own grandchildren will be strong enough to take back the sunken world. And the giants will be waiting for you. <laughs>